We had thought today to honor Barbara Guest, um, uh, who is a graduate of, of Berkeley and a great poet, and she had a stroke on Christmas Day, um, and is recovering, and, but is not able to read today. So we've asked some of her friends to read. I thought that we really should have bouquets of flowers for this brilliant poet, and I was looking forward to it, and I'm sorry that she's not here. But she knows this reading is happening and that her poet friends are um, going to be reading her poems. Her daughter, Hadley, who's with her almost daily, all day at the hospital, is here and will report back, and Barbara will see the videotape of this um, event. So we can speak to her and say, we love you, Barbara, get better. I'm going to read one of her poems, um, I guess taking off from the Robert Frost medal. Um, Frost's famous poem, The Road Not Taken, Two Paths Diverged in a Yellow Wood. I took the one less traveled by. Barbara's version of that poem is called, is called Santa Fe Trail. I go separately. The sweet knees of oxen have pressed a path for me. Ghosts with ingots have burned their bare hands. It is the dungaree darkness with china stitched, where the westerly winds and the traveler's checks, the even song of salesmen, the glistening paraphernalia of twin suitcases, where no one speaks English. I go separately. It is the wind, the rubber wind when we brush our teeth in the way station, a climate to beard. What forks these roads? Who clamors o'er the twain? What murmurs and rustles in the distance, in the white branches where the light is whipped, piercing at the crossing, as into the dunes we simmer and toss ourselves a while? The motor pants like a forest where owls with their bandaged eyes send messages to the Indian couple. Peaks, have you heard? I go separately. We have reached the arithmetics, are partially quenched while it growls and hints in the last trapper's voice. She is coming toward us like a session of pines in the wild wooden air where rabbits are frozen. Oh, mother of lakes and glaciers, save us gamblers whose wagon is perilously wrapped. That's Barbara Guest. Well, thank you, Bob. Um, I feel so privileged to be here because there are so many f friends of Barbara's who are poets who could have had this honor to be reading here today. Um, and it's interesting, the go alone aspect of Barbara that Bob has um, brought out. Um, and I sort of was uh, looking at the collective aspect, and uh, she just cannot be um, summarized. <laughs> um, and I'm going to mostly read um, my words. Um, it has been a pleasure to come to know Barbara Guest as a publisher of her work, and in conversations with her since she moved from New York City to Berkeley in the early 1990s. <coughs> If there is a dream of art and life as continually reflecting one another, of conversation reflecting poetry, of poetry reflecting fiction, of fiction reflecting biography and art criticism and writing theory, then Barbara embodies this ideal. This, as she said in tribute to someone else, one-voiced art. Um, in 2003, Kelsey Street published Barbara's book of writings on writing, writing on writing, called Forces of Imagination, um, well titled. Barbara invited Laurie Reed to do the cover art, and the book includes interior images as well. It's full of surprise and pleasure. And I'm going to read a piece from that, um, Under the Shadow of Surrealism, which appears um, 
For me, it's as close to a credo or manifesto as Barbara Guest could ever come. I'm going to read a shorter version uh, that appears in a book of Barbara's art writings uh, called Durer in the Window, which came out in the same year from Roof. And this was just a year after Wesleyan brought out a book of poems, miniatures, and other poems. Um, and all this publishing activity when Barbara was in her early 80s. It's just amazing. So from Durer, which includes Barbara's uh, writings from pieces from Art News, also some comics that she did with Joe Brainerd, um, is this wonderful piece, The Shadow of Surrealism. I grew up under the shadow of surrealism. In that creative atmosphere of magical rites, there was no recognized separation between the arts. Those of us who shared this atmosphere brightened by Apollinaire, Eluard, Valerie, and the old master Mallarmé, considered ourselves part of a hemisphere where all the arts evolved around one another, a central plaza with roads which led from the palette to quill to clef. One could never again look at a locked kingdom. Poetry extended vertically as well as horizontally. Never did it lie motionless within a linear structure. Assisting in this poetic mobility would be an associative art within whose eye the poet might gaze for reassurance and for a glowing impersonal empathy. We have read of the relation of Gertrude Stein to Picasso. She saw her own work and Cubist painting as engaged in a similar struggle. She even went so far as to write Cubist portraits. <coughs> what she was actually seeking was an escape from literature or from the literary. And she saw and envied the freedom shared by Picasso, Brock, and Gris in their breakthrough from formalism to Cubism. <coughs> Painters were the revolutionaries to whom writers turned their desire to break from the solemnity and the judicious rules of their craft. This need to go on a rampage was felt by poets during the explosive era of abstract expressionism. We ended by admiring not only the work of painters with its action, which meant breaking the rules, acting upon the canvas the otherwise concealed emotional and environmental state of the painter, we became envious of the activity of their personal lives. This may appear to be a frivolous remark, but it contains a metaphor in which the natural gravity of life is replaced by the gratification of secret desires. Art as reflection became more instantaneous, willful, enthusiastic, freed by action. Painters naturally gravitated towards expensive cars, lofts, and chateaus, while poets take buses, settle in dim rooms, with the exception of Rilke, and until the event of the word processor satisfied themselves with modestly turned print. Money rolls into the pockets of painters with a frequency that stuns the poet. <laughs> Just as the extravagance of a painter is admired, so is his ability to leap the boundaries of experiment or assume the labors of a chauvinist past. Some of us did desire to sit under the same umbrella as Picasso, even share his villa at Mougin. The physical extravagance of paint of enormous canvases can cause a nurturing envy in the poet that prods his greatest possession, the imagination into an expansion of its borders. As an art critic who happened to be a poet, I was exposed to the temperament of the explosion of abstract expressionism. My personal relationships with its painters certainly influenced the way I saw both nature and image. It was a poet, Frank O'Hara, who in a poem described the process of abstract expressionism far more intuitively than any critic or art historian. Thanks, Patricia. One of the things that really inspires me about Barbara Guest's work is that um, in her development, she's just grown increasingly radical and innovative. She's not about repeating herself or falling into tired 
formulas. Um, she makes incredible demands on herself as a as a poet and insists that each new work is is a new foray into an unknown territory. Um, so, dissonance, royal traveler. Sound opens sound. Shank of globe, strings floating out. Something like images are here, opening up avenues to view a dome. A distant clang reaches the edifice. Understanding what it means to understand music. Cloudless movement beyond the next reach. An hypnotic lull in porcelain. Water break mimics tonality. Crunch of sand under waddling. A small seizure from monumentality does not come or go with understanding. The path will end, birdhouse of trembling cotton, or dream, expelled it parcel on the landlocked moor, explaining music and their clothes entangled who walk into a puddle of minnows, minnows in a bowl, consonant with water, the drifted footpad ambushed by reeds signals the listening oars. Music disappears into oars. In the middle, the world is brown. On the opposite side of the earth, an aroma of scarlet. This accompanies our hearing music, the sleeve of heaven and the hoof of earth loosed from their garrison. Dissonance may abandon miserere on bruised knee, hasten to the idol. And what is consonance, the recluse, entering and exiting as often as a monarch butterfly touches a season, by accident grips the burning flowers. In the stops between terror, the moon aflame on its plaza. Autumn of rippling wind and the noise of baskets, smell of tin fists and harsh fists on the waterfall changing the season. The horse romps in flax, a cardboard feature creating a cycle of flax. Music imagines this cardboard, the horse in cardboard jacket, flagrant the, ra the ragged grove, red summit, red. Dissonance royal traveler altered the red saddle. Um, and I'd like to end with uh, a poem from Barbara's brand new book, The Red Gaze, which just appeared from Wesleyan a few days ago. It's, it's hot off the press, and, and it's a marvelous book. Uh, Barbara, as Patricia mentioned, is, is, is influenced by surrealism. And uh, last year, uh, during the time when she was writing this book, she, she was constantly talking about surrealism and accessing it in various ways. The original title, uh, and, the, and the poems in this book went through many revisions. The original working title of the poem I'm, I'm about to read was She Honors De Chirico. Uh, she, uh, Barbara since has revised that, and now the poem, poem's title reads Loneliness. Wounded, the tower and green of the meadow below. O meadow, O furnaces, royalty passes you. Quick steps make a noise. She rides on her palfrey, the maiden. Bouquets fall from her green hair. Shadows on grass reflect a loneliness everywhere. O oh, furnaces, royalty passes you. Quick steps make a noise. She rides on her palfrey, the maiden. Her green hair glistens. How solitary, low, on the river, a monument passes by. Uh, um, I thought I'd read a few, uh, few um, pieces from uh, a book of Barbara wrote in 1999 called uh, The Confetti Trees. And uh, it... Uh, it practically appeared like simultaneously with two other books of hers because she's so prolific that um, you know I, I think it's you know people haven't even caught up to it yet you know what I mean and uh, and also sort of it's kind of like it's a book 
that's kind of like poetic short stories and film criticism and other stuff. So it's pretty interesting stuff. Uh, so I thought I'd re read a few pieces of, from this. Uh, this. This one's called Nuns. The story was about nuns shedding their habits. It was supposed to be a documentary with a close-up in the cloister of one nun walking in the new dress of a nun. Something simple in cotton or wool with a cardigan and low shoes where the order is given to the wardrobe department. The other nun would wear the discarded nun habit with a rosary at the waist. Unfortunately, the wardrobe department had packed away or sold the original habits and had not ordered any replacements. The picture was about to be canceled when the director had the idea of taking his crew over to a convent and filming his picture there. At this point, an argument began about where they would find a convent. A member of the crew told them that nuns lived on church grounds, or so he thought, and why didn't they move their equipment to a neighborhood Catholic church? Then an argument broke out about whether they should use the actresses who had already been chosen after much delay in search, or if the nuns in the church that was yet to be located would permit themselves to be filmed. The nuns would add authenticity to what was proposed as a documentary. <laughs> At this point, the actresses said they would sue the company because their contracts were already signed. It was also mentioned that there might be a clause in the contracts of nuns that did not permit them to act for commercial purposes. <laughs> commercial purposes was familiar to the production department, and after no more than an hour, word came from the head office saying the department would be delighted to make a gift to the church of choice if one were selected as soon as possible, as the production manager was already annoyed at the delay. The director, idle during these conversations, retired to his van and was reading the counterfeiters while he sipped his afternoon vodka with orange juice. His, assistants, his assistant climbed into the van and they began to discuss André Gide and how seldom in French letters did one find a writer who was Protestant. <laughs> the director remarked that it was quite a coincidence that he, the son of a Protestant minister, should be making a documentary about nuns. Old films about nuns used star material like Ingrid Bergman. It was absurd to make this documentary with third-rate actresses in local churches. They were deciding to take the company to Lourdes when the telephone rang, canceling the picture. The church in Beverly Hills wanted too much money, and the priest of the Church of the Angels near Ol Olivera Street was in Mexico. <laughs> uh, let's see. Maybe we'll, we'll do one more called uh, Lubitsch. She was handed this beautiful opportunity of directing a film she truly believed in. The truly had been written into her astonishingly female-oriented contract, and for days she had been considering scripts, even books. Now she was in a blue funk. The color blue flew under her lids, as did a passing memory of Erwatang by Schoenberg. A pink tulip was added to a painting near Tipolo. She noticed a bowl of raisins placed near her desk. Did they belong there? All at once she remembered a little girl with a cow, and she believed the little girl once belonged to in a nursery rhyme in a book called Smooth Realities. The pink dress of the little girl, even the bows on the dress that went with the tulip that went with the room. Even the postman, meanwhile, the postman delivered a large package wet from rains that besieged her city. She put the package on a table and a plum rolled out of a grocery bag her daughter carelessly placed on the table. The cat came downstairs and bit her leg. She remembered the blue cat who had fallen out the window in Switzerland. There had been a tall old tree under the window and the cat had lain in the tree for days alive and meowing while the people below in the first floor apartment had told her the cat was dead and had been carried away. She looked at the palm tree outside. She began to weep a little and tears gathered in her eyes just beneath the memory. The door opened and her husband walked into the room. He had been away on a trip. He put a suitcase on the floor and embraced her. His gaze, however, was not on her, but towards the open door of the kitchen, from which came the warning smell of burned chicken. I'm going to get rid of this, she said to herself, closing her eyes. When she opened them, her husband was gone, and so was the odor of burnt chicken. That is real editing, she said out loud. <laughs> then she talked to herself about montage, montage and how people neglected it, etc. She really began to believe she had completed a picture and her husband was home to celebrate with her. Her daughter, or the cook, she added, as she liked to think the studio paid her more than it did, had, make a coco, had made a coco varm 
the same kind of chicken they served in the films of Ernst Lubitsch that took place on the left bank. She remembered the champagne they served in Lubitsch films, even when faced with poverty and bitter times. Then another tear formed in her eye with the memory of the chiffon dresses that floated over his shiny floors. She heard the music, the music that lightened his touch, moody but not sad, doors that accompanied his motion pictures, shining like the floors, promising secrets. You climbed up his handsome stairs to the great doors that swung open, to men sitting in chairs and drinking and laughing, lying. People lied in his pictures and you never minded. Only betrayed people opened his doors. Dreamers in Lubitsch films, gifted people like herself, determined to exit the snare of everyday life. What did the dream-laden Lubitsch know about everyday life? Then she recalled the eyes of a former Hungarian baroness. She had played with a little fan tied to her wrist as she confided her life story. Tears, international tears, of loss and regret lay nested in her eyes. Now it occurred to the director that she was not in need of a script. All day she had been montaging bits of stories. Her script was already written. It was composed as an intermezzo, a breeze in the middle of the day. Her film would be the length of an intermezzo, whispers, interruptions, innuendos, a memory confided across the table before the half bottle of champagne is served. Um, pleasure to, to be here at Lunch Poems. Thanks to, to Bob and to Zach, as always, for putting this on. And thanks to you all for your attendance and, um, and interest in so many different types of poetry. I think the Lunch Poems really represents so many different um, working relationships to poetry. And it's really admirable in that way. Um, I, I second what everyone has said about Barbara's uh, uh, just capacity and just the fantastic range of her mind. Uh, I hope some of it is coming through and um, you can see the range and uh, the wit and the, the brilliance and the wonder that she has with, uh, in relationship to language. Um, I think all poets great poets who are working um, in this kind of range have, have a peculiarity that we don't quite understand. Um, and she is just very particular in her quest. Um, I th I'm going to read three poems um, that represent kind of aspects of that. Um, the first is what I think of as sort of um, has to do with her, her particular modernist um, quest, which I think of modernism as, you know, some trying to make some very uneasy truce between um, the internal uh, uh, sort of elements of consciousness and, and art and um, an, an uneasy world. Um, and she's always trying to work out what it means to represent reality and to make consciousness. This is from... Um, Fair, her book, Fair, Fair Realism. An emphasis falls on reality. Cloud fields change into furniture. Furniture metamorphizes into fields. An emphasis falls on reality. It snowed toward morning, a barcarolle. The words stretched severely. Silhouettes they arrived in trenchant cut the face of lilies. I was envious of fair realism. I desired sunrise to revise itself as apparition, majestic in evocativeness, two fountains traced nearby on a lawn. You recall treatments of being and nothingness, illuminations apt to appear from variable directions. They are orderly as motors floating on the waterway. So silence is pictorial when silence is real. <clears throat> the wall is more real than shadow, or that letter composed of calligraphy. Each vowel replace, replaces a wall, a costume taken from space, donated by walls. These metaphors may be apprehended after they have brought their dogs and cats born on roads near willows. Willows are not real trees. They entangle us in looseness, the natural world spins in green. A column chosen from distance mounts into sky, 
while the font is classical. They will destroy the disturbed font as it enters modernity and is rare. The necessary idealizing of you reality is part of the search, the journey where two figures embrace. This house was drawn for them. It looks like a real house. Perhaps they will move in today into ephemeral dust and move out of that into night, selective night with trees, the darkened copies of all trees. Again, I, I hope that you'll get to read her work and, and um, just find its varieties. And um, she is doing better and improving really at a wonderful rapid rate and so we're really so grateful for her work and, and so Olivia is going to read one more poem hi I'm Olivia Friedman I'm an undergraduate here at UC Berkeley um, I first fell in love with Miss Guest's poetry a year ago and was first introduced to it a year ago when I took a junior seminar here on the New York School Poets, which included John Ashbery, Frank O'Hara, and Barbara Guest. Um, in that class, we read The Location of Things, and in The Location of Things, I found this poem, Parachutes My Love Could Carry Us Higher. It is my favorite love poem. Um, I should also mention it's on the Poet's Walk, which is on Addison Street. So here is Parachutes My Love Could Carry Us Higher. I just said I didn't know. And now you are holding me in your arms. How kind. Parachutes My Love Could Carry Us Higher. Yet around the net I am floating. Pink and pale blue fish are caught in it. They are beautiful, but they are not good for eating. Parachutes, my love, could carry us higher than this mid-air in which we tremble, having exercised our arms in swimming. Now the suspension, you say, is exquisite. I do not know. There is coral below the surface. There is sand and berries, like pomegranates grow. This wide net. I am treading water near it. Bubbles are rising and salt drying on my lashes. Yet I am no nearer air than water. I am closer to you than land. And I am in a stranger ocean than I wished. <laughs>